Good morning, friends. Welcome to Grace Online. We're grace for everyone, community for everyone, church for everyone. And we are walking through the book of Nehemiah for October in a series that focuses on rebuilding and restoring and renewal. It's rebuild, restore, renew. I love a good restoration project. If I had the time and the money, there would be a classic truck in my garage for me to tinker on and to bring back to its former majesty. Like maybe one day um, I'll, I'll have, you know, a 1960s Chevy half ton or Ford half ton. Uh, that's kind of been the dream of mine. I used to do it with old bikes, actually. I'd find rusted out old frames and bring them back to roadworthy rides once again. The first one I did was literally a garden ornament. It was a mid-50s Eaton's glider, had like the top bar had what was called a camelback. Um, it was completely rusted out. It was sitting in somebody's front yard that I would walk by when I would walk Maddie to and from school when she was little. And so I saw it sitting under the tree and I knocked on the door and I asked, hey, what's, what's going on with that bike? And they're like, I don't know, I rent this place. And I said, like, well, would you ask if there's any way that they'd be willing to let go of that bicycle? And so they gave it to me. They gave it to me for free. They had no use for it. And I turned that into what I called the smooth criminal, painted it flat black with black and white, um, wheels on it and uh, turned it into like a board track uh, racer kind of based on a mid 50s um, mid 50s bicycle and it, it was kind of a fun thing to do it had a like early turn of the century spring saddle on it uh, I did up a, a tricycle uh, for my niece June for her birthday a mid 40s tricycle for her for her but one of the most laborious ones one of the most challenging bikes that I built I actually entered into a contest on a a website called ratrodbikes.com. Uh, and I documented all the progress. I found a frame down in southern Manitoba, a 1940s uh, bicycle frame that ha would have had a tank in it, but the tank had gone missing. Uh, and I built a bike called Orange Crush, complete with a like tank that opened up and had a vintage Orange Crush bottle in it. And it was a ton of fun, but it was a lot of work. Like getting brakes that haven't been used in decades to, to work again takes some doing. Ensuring that tires spin true and that bearings get repacked with sometimes original bearings means getting your hands dirty and maybe the occasional bloody knuckle from wrenches that spin. I used a, a hammer and an anvil to bend fenders back into place. I, I rebuilt parts from old cars and tractors to add a, a headlight and basically to creating a work of art from old scraps. And I, I never really kept track of the hours, uh, but the contest ran for like four months, and I spent many a late night working away in the garage. I did happen to land third place in North America for one of the coolest bikes built. But restoration is hard work. Uh, it, it takes a lot to take a frame that's in rough shape that the pedals don't turn anymore and to rebuild it and get it back to riding on the road. If you've ever tried to, you know, strip and sand an old piece of furniture or you've worked on an old house with lath and plaster walls, you know that restoration is hard work. And as we see in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah had this plan and this passion, but the actual work of rebuilding the walls wasn't going to be a weekend project. It was going to take some hard work. This wasn't just some easy task. And so we're going to look into the hard work of restoration today as we get back into the book of Nehemiah. Come with me to chapter 2. Now, typically when we walk through a book of the Bible here at Grace, we go verse by verse and we try and dig into exactly what scripture might have to say for us today. And, and this series, because we're trying to do Nehemiah just in the month, is maybe going to be a little more contracted. So I'd encourage you to read through the book all the way through and maybe even a couple of times over the month as we dig into the story because we're going to jump around, especially today. It'll be kind of chapter 2. We'll gloss over chapter 3 and a couple of verses out of chapter 4. But come with me back to the ancient city of Jerusalem. Imagine yourself some 400 years before the birth of Jesus. Um, some 140 years since the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. And, and many people in Israel have been carried off into exile in Babylon. And as we learned last week, Nehemiah has had this a vision or this dream to go back and rebuild the walls. He's learned that the temple is rebuilt, but that the city walls still lie in ruin. So he has this vision and this passion to rebuild the walls. He's been granted permission by the king of Persia to return to the city and to bring about some much needed restoration. So we pick off where we left the story last week in chapter two of Nehemiah. 
Beginning at verse 11, it says, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on to the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through, so I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials didn't know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. But then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let's start rebuilding. Let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. So far for now. Last week, we left off Nehemiah asking the king of Persia for permission to return from exile to the holy city Jerusalem because he had heard reports that the city walls still lie in ruins after decades uh, of rebuilding the temple. And this news so grieved Nehemiah that he spent weeks, even months, fasting and praying And eventually coming to the king to ask for permission to leave his post as the cupbearer and return to the city. And so Nehemiah is granted permission. He's he's given this favor and he's sent with lumber and soldiers and some fellow exiles to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. And I love this. Nehemiah says, I went back to Jerusalem. I spent three days there. And then at night he goes out and he assesses the damage on the walls. He kind of does a loop around the perimeter. And there's some details there about, you know, places where the horse couldn't even pass through just to show just how broken down the city walls were. But Nehemiah gets the lay of the land and he hasn't really told anybody what he's up to yet, why they're back there. The, the, the plan hasn't been laid out, but he wants to determine the, the, the extent of the destruction. And after understanding just how much of a mess was in front of them, he calls the men and says, you see the trouble that we're in. Like, look around you. You can see that Jerusalem lies in ruins. So let's rebuild. Let's restore. Let's build this back to what it once was. And he shares the story of God's favor and the blessing that the king has sent them with. And the response of the men is, then let's get cracking. Let us rebuild. Let us start rebuilding. They, they caught this vision of what they could accomplish together. And so it says that they began this good work. So Nehemiah sees the need. He shares that need with others around him, and they begin to tackle the work together. And it's a great picture of what it looks like when the people of God come together for a cause, that they've heard the need, and they begin to partner together in that good work. Last week, we mentioned that we needed some help on Tuesday evening for our kids club, and a few of you have already responded, so I want to thank you for that. If, if others are thinking about ways that they can be involved in the church, I'd, I'd encourage you to partner with us in this good work. This last week at, at kids club, we actually had 26 kids, which was almost twice as many kids as the previous week. So there's lots of work to be done. There's lots of opportunity for us to engage. And we can't do it alone. And that's what Nehemiah realized. He came back, he assessed the damage, and then he called others to gather around him and begin that work of rebuilding. But it doesn't take long before Nehemiah runs up against some opposition. In Nehemiah 2.19, we read, But when Sambalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? Now, we skipped over a couple of verses that foreshadow this opposition. A couple of verses earlier, when Nehemiah was given permission to go and blessed with all these supplies, we read that Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, they, these officials heard about it, and they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. They were very much disturbed. And once they see what's happening, that the people have started to rebuild, they begin to speak their mind, and they ridicule, they mock Nehemiah and the others who had begun the good work of rebuilding the walls. And we always run into these sort of snags when we go about restoration and rebuilding, don't we? 
Like whether it's rusty bike parts that don't come apart the way that you hoped they would, or you know, surprises behind the drywall that you weren't anticipating when you decide that you're gonna remodel a house, it rarely goes as smoothly as we would hope. Renovations always take twice as long and cost twice as much as you had planned. When we think of the things that are in our lives that are maybe in need of some restoration or some renewal, we can likely think of areas in our own hearts and minds that need to be brought to life again. And it's rarely a straight line when we grow in these areas. Discipleship and, and becoming more like Jesus isn't just this continual trajectory upward. Like how often have you committed to, to, to change something in your life? Maybe it's to, you know, I'm going to pray every day or, or I'm going to read the Bible more often or, or I'm going to guard my tongue or, you know, you have this thing that you've decided that you want to do, that you want to change, that you want to walk in greater obedience only to find that like three days in it's slipped your mind or you slept in or you forgot to do it and you already botched the plan. How often have you wanted to make a change Change some behavior that's destructive or detrimental. And maybe you're great for a few days, but old habits die hard and you find yourself falling back into the same old patterns. But restoration is hard work. Change takes effort. And it doesn't usually go in a perfectly straight line. It's often two steps forward, one step back. It's often making a decision, but then coming up against some sort of resistance. Changing our lives sometimes happens in big and dramatic ways. Sometimes the work of the Spirit is like sweeping and miraculous, but more often than not, it's a simple plodding in the same direction. It's the daily choosing that I'm going to walk in the footsteps of Jesus today. I'm going to become more like him. It's the, the regular confession of our sins and finding ways, new ways sometimes to walk in the light. And it often feels like hard work because it is. Working on ourselves isn't easy. And relationships with other people can be just as tricky or even more difficult to navigate. If, if we've managed to start the work on ourselves and become more like Jesus, we still interact with other people. And we probably have relationships that we recognize that are in need of some rebuilding or restoration or renewal. How do you begin the repair? or How do you begin to take steps towards restoration when it involves another person well first i think it's helpful to realize that not every relationship you're in is designed to last forever like we have people in our lives who are there for a season and whether it's a move or a change of life some relationships do just kind of fade into our past they were there for a season and for a time and they were life-giving and beneficial but they may not be long-term relationships that are going to exist forever. Like maybe think of the friends that you had in high school. You may still connect with a couple of them, but it's unlikely that you've put a ton of effort into cultivating healthy relationships with each and every person that you went to elementary and middle and high school with. There are relationships that we have that are there for a season, but there are also relationships that are unhealthy, and a breakdown is not always something that needs to be fully repaired. Like if you have been in a relationship where you've been mistreated by someone or abused. It's not your responsibility to repair that relationship. Like, I have people in, in my life that I hold no animosity towards anymore. I'm able to pray for and hope for the best for them, but we're never going to be best friends because of a breakdown in relationship. Now, I have had to do the work to work through the pain and, and extend forgiveness and choose to walk in, in forgiveness and come to peace with the fact that the relationship isn't going to be what it once was. And I think that that's okay. I think it's okay to recognize that that's not always going to be the case. We're called to love everyone. And I think it's possible to love people without having everyone become your absolute best friend and closest confidant. But there are those relationships that are worth going that extra mile and worth putting in that extra effort. Like if you're in a committed relationship with a significant other or siblings or, or parents, people that you know you, you are going to be engaged with for the rest of your life, those are worth putting effort and energy into if there's been some sort of breakdown. Like too often I've done funerals where the family has had some disagreement decades before and people are still not talking to each other. 
And they come to the, t- the time where they gather together and there's this awkward sense of we've missed so much of each other's lives. We've missed so much time. What, what then seemed like a mountain, like a very big deal, now seems almost inconsequential. And you can't get that time back. So when you see those breakdowns, especially in those relationships that you know are worth investing in, how do you rebuild? Well, I would encourage you to start small. I confess I'm still figuring this out, but I follow the advice of the Apostle Paul. This is what motivates me. In Romans chapter 12, verse 16, it says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I love that advice. Live in harmony. Live in humility. Like, be willing to take the first step. Be the first to say sorry. If they hurt you, pray for them. Bless them. Repay them with kindness. I love the little disclaimer there. If it is possible. If it's possible, live at peace with them. As far as it depends on you. Because you don't get to control how people accept or react to your apology or to your attempts to rebuild something that's been broken down. And you might face opposition, and that's okay. But as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. It means that you don't just sit around and wait for somebody else to apologize or to give up on a relationship that needs repair. It's that as much as it depends on you, you look to live in peace and harmony and humility. Do everything in your power to rebuild and restore and renew and leave the results to Jesus. God is the one who's able to restore. When he talks about vengeance there, it's like you don't, you don't worry about how they're going to you know, pay for the injustice that's been done. God is able to repair and renew. We do our part and we let God do his. But again, it's not easy work. It's hard work. The work of restoration is difficult. Let's get back into Nehemiah before we wrap up this week. Chapter 3 records all of the gates that have been burned down and broken and how, that they, how they were repaired. And we're not going to read through it all today, but it's interesting to see how many different names get mentioned and how many times it's like, you know, this, this priest and the other priests rebuilt this gate. And next to them were, was this gentleman and his family that rebuilt. And, and it, it, the amount of times that it says, and next to him, or the next section, it gets mentioned over and over again that there are many hands that make light work in this situation. But the hard work of restoration and the resistance that comes just keeps on coming. It says that Sambalat hasn't given up at this point. Chapter 4 opens with him angry and greatly incensed. He ridicules and mocks, but now threatens the workers so much that the workers have to take up arms to defend themselves. They've already accomplished much, but there's still much to do. And now they're under the threat of attack. Nehemiah 4 verse 6 says that we rebuilt the wall till it, all of it reached half of its height, for the people worked with all their heart. The people worked with all their heart, and they got halfway there. <sighs> Isn't that how life feels sometimes? We put all of our effort and energy into something, and it still feels like two steps forward, one step back. We're always just getting halfway there. There's always some sort of resistance or opposition, always more work to be done. But the people didn't give up, even in the face of weariness and discouragement. We continue reading in chapter 4. It says, Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. And the enemies said, Before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. But the Jews who lived near them came and told us time and time again, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. And after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we returned 
to the wall, each to our own work. It says we all return to the wall, each to our own work. They continued the hard work of restoration. Now with one hand on a sword or a spear, half the men stood guard and defended the weak spots while others worked. And they worked from dawn till dusk. Nehemiah 4.21 says, we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. And I love the grittiness of the Bible here. Like, it's real stuff. When Nehemiah was in Persia in the royal court, he dreamt of the walls being restored. He had this vision or, or this hope that things could be restored. And he prayed and he fasted and he wept and he received favor and blessing from the king to come, to come back with craftsmen and lumber and he was going to rebuild the gates. But it wasn't smooth sailing. It wasn't just some, you know, HGTV home makeover show where, show where a team like rolls in and transform a house and the neighbors get involved and there's tears all around and how beautiful and uplifting it is. You know, all of their problems solved in 22 minutes. That's not how life works. This is real life. Restoration is hard work. It's hard work to work on yourself, to deal with your insecurities and your selfishness. It's hard work to change. It's hard work to maintain healthy relationships with friends and family, especially when there's been a breakdown and restoration is needed. It's hard work to have a healthy church community that's focused on meeting the needs of the people that call it home and continuing to reach out to others that they might know the grace of God in significant ways. It's hard work, but it's worthy work. It's worth all the blood, sweat, and tears. Like when you look back on who you used to be and see the person that you are today, much more like Jesus now than you were back then, that feels amazing. To know that you've been listening to the Spirit and walking in His ways, learning how to live obediently, that's worthy work. It's worth engaging in that kind of work to become more like Jesus. When you have relationships that are loving and healthy, where you accept one another and you encourage one another and you bless one another, that is an incredible gift. And if those relationships have been through some rough water, well, then the peace is even more refreshing. To know that you didn't give up, to know that you didn't let something break you down, that's worthy work. When you see a church living out the Great Commission, making disciples, helping the poor, which we're going to talk about next week, loving God by loving our neighbor, when you're part of something bigger than yourself, working shoulder to shoulder on your part of the wall, that's worthy work. Restoration is hard work, but it is the work of the Spirit. It's what God is always up to. Like, if you want to know where God's at work, look for the dark places where light is breaking through. Like, look at those hopeless places where redemption is still possible. Like, think about the whole story of redemption. Humanity was lost, and a Savior came to us. In our darkest hour, when he hung on the cross, he cried out from that cross, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He has always been and will always be about restoration, all about calling people back to himself, all about raising people up, all about resurrection and redemption and restoration. And it's hard work, but it's worthy work because it's God's work. So how can you partner with God in that work? Are there some areas of your inner life that need some restoration? Maybe some dark places in your heart and mind that need the light. Maybe there are attitudes and actions that need to be a little more Christ-like. Ask God to help you rebuild, to begin that work of restoration, step by step, brick by brick. Start small. Pray a simple prayer of surrender to the Spirit. Not my will, but yours be done. In my heart, in my mind, not my will, but yours be done. And then commit to changing one little thing that week. Ask God to help you. Ask God to remind you and to catch you when you fall. And get up and try again. You're going to face resistance, but keep building because the hard work of restoration is worth doing. Are there some relationships that are in need of some restoration? Well, as far as it depends on you, how can you make some peace? Is it a phone call? Is it humbling yourself to say sorry? It's never too late to say sorry. Is it choosing a new way forward, being conscious of how we speak to and about one another, finding ways to rebuild? It isn't easy work, but it's worthy work. And are there ways that you can help the church rebuild? Like chapter three records so many names and it's tough to get an accurate tally of exactly how many people helped repair the sections. But that phrase, each in front of their own house or opposite their house, occurs over and over again. Each person took responsibility for a section of the wall. And as we'll read later, they accomplished this massive task of rebuilding the wall 
in just 52 days because so many joined in the work. As we rebuild our capacity here at Grace to serve the community, there are places for you to get involved in the work, whether it's on Tuesday night with Kids Club or Sunday morning with our host team or tech. We're in the process of revamping our life groups and and even our online experience. So there's ways where you could be involved in those things, doing our best to repair those things that are most beneficial to repair, only rebuilding those things that we have enough workers to help make it happen, but to see ourselves continue to build in order that the Great Commission might happen. Our commitment at the moment doesn't extend beyond Tuesday nights, Friday night, Sunday morning with church at home which is getting an upgrade very soon. But as we rebuild, there's going to be more opportunities to do more together. So what part of the wall do you feel responsible for? How can you help us rebuild? You can talk to any one of us pastors about your passion, your gifting, where you feel like you could plug in. Even if it's digitally, if you're part of grace for everyone, being part of church at home, ways that you can connect and serve the community. You can do it from a distance. You don't have to be in the building. Restoration is hard work, but it is worthy work. So how will you engage in it this week? Whether it's in your own heart, whether it's in the relationships around you, or whether it's in the life of the church and the body as we uh, gather together as grace for everyone. How will you engage with the work, the hard work of restoration, but the worthy work of restoration, God's work of restoration? Let's pray. God, we want to be about your business, the business of restoration and renewal in our own hearts and lives would your spirit completely rule and reign over us that we might be daily becoming more like jesus in our relationships we walk in the humility and love that breaks down barriers and repairs broken places would would your spirit so move through us that people experience healing that only you can provide would you would you help us as much as it depends on us to live at peace with everyone and when it comes to your church Show us how we can help the body be more healthy and vibrant. Help us to chip in and use our talents to serve your people in the community at large. Help us even in the face of opposition to be about the hard work, but the good work of restoration. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us again with Church at home. Uh, We're working on some updates to this online experience that we hope will make this time even more meaningful and engaging for you as part of Grace Online. So stay tuned for that in the coming weeks. I'd ask you to pray for our leadership team. We're heading out on a retreat next weekend to continue dreaming and planning for our future. Would you pray that we have a sense uh, of the, the leading of the Spirit, that God might give us creativity and vision for the coming months for how we could continue to be grace for everyone. Oh, we're praying for you. We pray that you might know the joy of his salvation, uh, the peace of his reconciliation, and the love of his invitation to daily come to him, and that you may know deep in your bones that by God's amazing grace, we are the body of Christ. And because of that great grace, let us go into the world in peace and courage, holding to the good, honoring all of God's children, loving and serving the Lord by loving and serving our neighbor, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, And the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Peace to you.